My name is Scott. Please stand for the reading of God's word. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all those who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father, Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. The word of the Lord. You go. Thank you, Scott. You guys have a seat. Uh, please pray with me as we uh, jump into these often difficult and, and, and um, interesting chapters of Scripture today. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that um, this is your word, and we can always stand on your word, what your word says, and regardless of our own um, viewpoints, um, regardless of our own opinions, your word stands. Your word is good, and it is what it is. It says what it says. And so let us just be faithful to it. Help me to be faithful to it as I teach through it. And um, God, humble all of us under your word today. Um, just let us see it for what it truly says and encourage us properly and convict us properly and um, just lead us forward in godliness uh, for your glory in all things. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, uh, we jumped back into our Roman series. Just a quick um, reminder, there are all sorts of Romans resources online, eastridge.church slash Romans, okay? So you can go watch every sermon we've preached this year on Romans, all the reading plans, podcasts, which also starts back today after church, the after church podcast, um, where we're going to talk through a lot more of Romans 9, 10, and 11, okay? So, um, but man, we, we went over last year, or last week, um, Romans 1 through 8, again, just to give a, a quick recap. And we end, obviously, in Romans 8 with this amazing, chapter with all these wonderful, amazing promises that God makes to his people, right? Romans 8 lets us know things like we are not condemned in our sins. We're made fully right in the sight of God. We are given the Holy Spirit as the seal of our inheritance and the power to live as God's children, free from fear, able, able to suffer well, hopeful, and patient. We're told that our prayers are empowered by that Holy Spirit by him in us. We're told that God works all things for our good. We're told that we are being transformed into Christ's likeness. We're told that we are justified and glorified with Christ. We're told that Christ stands to advocate for us always. And we're told in Romans 8 that we can never be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are told those things. What a wonderful, amazing chapter of promise after promise after promise for the people of God. But here's the question. What if God doesn't keep his promises? What if God's a liar, right? Paul is assuming as he opens up chapter nine, now Paul didn't write like a big nine or anything like that. We have chapter nine in here, but um, as we get into Romans chapter nine, Paul is assuming that some might be asking the question, what about Israel? What about these ethnic people of God that had received the promises of God for thousands of years up to this point and now seem to have been left out because they haven't come to Christ, right? And so Paul opens up chapter nine. It's not on the screen, but he's just opening up chapter nine going, man, I'm in anguish about my people. You can, you can read you know, verses one through five. I'm in anguish because the Jews are not turning to Jesus. Paul himself was a Jewish man who was called to go and be the, prophet, or the, the apostle to the Gentile people. And everywhere that he went, if you read through the book of Acts, here's what you're going to see. The apostle Paul, as he goes town to town to town to town to town, he's supposed to go to the Gentiles, but he can't help himself but go to the Israelites first, to go to the Jews first. He goes into the synagogues. He reasons with them. He preaches to them. He pleads with them to come to faith in Jesus. And everywhere that he goes, you know what happens? They plug their ears, they reject it, and they run him out of town. And he's just in anguish over this. And he's going, man, the, the Jews, like they, they should have it. He says in verses one through five, he says, verse five, theirs are the patriarchs. From them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all forever. Praise amen. They should be the ones. 
of all people in the world who would see it and who would get it first and foremost. And they're, they're just, they're rejecting Jesus. And Paul is, he's anguished over this. And so it seems like maybe because God had made so many promises to them, his word has now failed. A uh, quick illustration. What if you had read online, you, you wanted to go get a haircut, right? Um, and you read online, there's a new barber in town and he's supposed to just be the greatest barber in the whole world. And he gives everybody the greatest haircut. And there's a guarantee right online. It says, if you walk in here and I cut your hair, you will receive the greatest haircut you've ever had in your life. It'll be amazing. And you go to the barber shop, and on the windows of the barber shop, it says, we promise you walk in this place, you get your hair cut by this barber, it's going to be the greatest haircut you've ever had in your life. And as you're walking in, you see people walking out looking like they just got ran over by a lawnmower. You see people walking out with like weird colors in their hair and streaks here and gashes there. And you're just like, what is going on? They're complaining about the barber. They're just talking about this place is crazy. Like don't believe anything they say. You would have a hard time going and sitting down in the chair, would you not? This is what's going on where Paul's just looking at this and assuming the Gentiles may be asking this question because the Roman church is full of Jews and Gentiles. Some Jews had come to Jesus, but by and large, it's Gentiles. And so they may be asking this question. Man, it seems like God made all these promises to Israel and yet they haven't come true. So can we trust what he said in chapter eight, Romans one through eight? Can we trust any of that if God doesn't seem to hold on to his promises to Israel. So let, let's look at the promises God did make to his people. A couple Old Testament passages, if you guys want to turn there. We're going to be in Romans 9, 10, and 11. But Genesis 12, if you want to flip over there with me, um, Genesis chapter 12. I got them bookmarked. I know y'all don't, but I'm going to get there quickly. Um, Genesis 12, 2 and 3. Here's a promise that he made to, uh, to Abraham. This is the Abrahamic covenant. This is Genesis 12. He says this, I will make you, Abraham, into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That's the Abrahamic covenant of the Old Testament that God made to Abraham and all of his descendants. You're going to be my people. That's what God told Abraham. Your people are going to be my people forever, all right? So that's the Israelites, and so what about that, right? So let's look at a different covenant. This is the Mosaic covenant. This is Moses, Deuteronomy 28, 9 and 10. He says, the Lord will establish you. He's talking to the Israelites. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he promised you on oath. If you keep the commands of the Lord, and that's an important part of this. If you keep the commands of the Lord, right? You're God and walk in his ways. Then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will fear you. So that's a promise through, through Moses and the Mosaic promises. If you would keep the commands I've given through Moses, then I will, I will bless you. You'll be my people. You'll be a holy people to me forever. And again, now in, in Paul's day, as he's writing to the Romans, it seems like maybe that hasn't stood up over the test of time. And then there's the Davidic covenant, David, King David, uh, 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. It says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, that's to King David. And he's talking about, man, David and his line would be on the throne in Israel. And it seems like maybe if he's talking about just physical lineage of David, maybe that promise has even failed. Because now even the kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel, is not a great nation state anymore. And so has that promise failed? And we know Jesus was in the line of David and he set up his kingdom. So man, we're, we're seeing that on, on that level. But they're maybe thinking about this just going, I don't know. Has God's word failed? And so he opens up in Romans 9, so if you want to get back there, verse 6, it is not as though God's word, it is not as though God's word had failed. Why? For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. That is a key verse in this entire section of scripture, chapters 9, 10, 11, this sort of predicated on that verse right there where Paul is kind of laying out this truth for us that maybe we have a misunderstanding of what exactly it means to be Israel, what exactly it means to be the people of God. And so he continues to explain, nor because they are all his descendants, are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Um, Paul has already talked a little bit about Abraham in chapter four of Romans. Okay. If you read chapter four of Romans, he's using Abraham as an illustration of people who have faith. Abraham was sort of the original patriarch of faith for the Israelites and all the descendants of Israel come through Abraham. And Abraham received God's promise by faith, right? God promised Abraham before he had children. He was an old, old man. His wife was old. She was barren. They had no kids. 
He promised them, I'm going to give you a son, and you're going to name him Isaac. Uh, Rebecca laughed, at, or uh, Sarah laughed at that, and uh, Isaac means laughter, which God has a sense of humor. So um, he gave him Isaac. And before that happened, though, here's what they did. Uh, Sarah had this idea, well, I can't have children. God promised you a son, so why don't you sleep with our handmaiden, Hagar, and have a different son? And he did. And he had Ishmael. But God had already made it clear, it's not going to be Ishmael. It's not going to be through human descent. It's not going to be through human will. I've made you a what? Promise. The child is going to be a child not of physical descent. It's going to be a child of promise. And yes, Isaac came from Abraham and Sarah physically, yes, but it was a child of promise because Sarah was barren. She had no business having a child, right? And so that's Paul's point when he's pointing back to Abraham going, God's people are not people that are based on physical lineage, his people are people based on promise. God has made a promise. He made a promise to Abraham. And the people of God are the people who accept that promise. Go back to chapter four, through faith, through faith. And now what? Faith in who? Faith in Jesus. That's the whole point of Romans one through eight is that the promises of God are, are ratified. How? By faith. It was always by faith. Abraham had faith. And so too must the people of God do all time. They must have faith. And so when he says, not all Israel is Israel, simply what he's saying is, those who have rejected the promises of God, now ratified through Jesus Christ, if they have rejected that, they're not the Israel that God was making the promises to. They, they might be descended from Abraham, but they're not Israel, not in that sense. The true Israel are those who have faith in Christ Jesus, right? And so when he says that, not all Israel are Israel. And then he, he goes on, look at verse 11. He says, yet before the twins were born, now he's talking about Jacob and Esau, okay? If you guys know, know your Bible, know Genesis. Jacob and Esau are twins born to Isaac, the son of Abraham, and his wife, Rebekah. Um, they're born to, to them, okay? So Jacob and Esau are twins. They come out at the same time. Literally, Jacob is holding on to the heel of Esau when they are born. This is weird stuff. But like, they're born, and, and Jacob's like, hold, he's, he's grasping his heel, right? And they literally come out, born at the same time. To make the point, God was always illustrating this point, it's not about when they're born. It's not about the physical descent because they're born at the same time with the same mom and dad. But he had already made a promise. The older will serve the younger, right? And because Jacob did come out second, he was grasping the heel of Esau. We, we see as we read through Genesis, Jacob is the one who receives the promises of God. Esau does not. And in fact, the Israelites, the, the Jacob's name later becomes Israel. The Israelites and the Edomites who are descended from Esau, man, they're always at odds with each other. You could argue even to this day um, that the, the Israelites and the Edomites are at odds with each other. We see this in the Middle East, do we not? It's constant conflict, constant war going on um, because God's people, he said, they, they're, they're a people of promise. Okay, and the, and the truth is this, y'all, as we walk through these passages, um, it is clear for us to see it is God's will and it is God's purpose and it is God's promise. Therefore, it is God's choice how that promise will be fulfilled. Is it not? God made the promise. And if God makes the promise, God begins the covenant. That's a nice, a nice biblical word um, for like a, a, a promised agreement, right? If God starts the covenant, he gets to choose how the covenant is brought forth and, and, and enacted and ratified, right? God gets to choose that. He chose Jacob, not Esau. He made that choice. God made that choice. And he actually says, um, as we continue to read this, verse 13, as I have written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated, right? Um, that, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. We talk about this a good bit more in the podcast, so please go listen to that. But that, that loved and hated, I think we got to take sort of the emotionalism out of that. Okay, he's not saying I don't like Esau at all, like yeah, I despise him in every way. He's just saying like, I chose Jacob to be the one who would carry on the promises. And I chose Esau to not be the one who would carry it. It's not up to men it's not up to our choice, y'all. This is why as we read this, we have to remain humble before the Lord because some of these are hard passages for us, aren't they? Like when you read something like this, you just go, oh, I don't know, that, that hurts a little bit. But God's just making it clear, I'm God. I'm God. And I choose through whom my promises will come, right? And so Paul asks the question that anybody would ask. Uh, look at verse 14 and 15, chapter nine. He says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Is God unjust? 
Let me pause a second to say this. Um, Paul is assuming people will ask that question because we ask that question. You read a verse like, like uh, verse 13 and you probably, that naturally comes to your mind. Is God unjust to choose someone to carry on his promises and to reject someone else? Esau is rejected, Jacob is chosen. Is he unjust? Paul's answer is no, not at all. Why? Because again, it's his promise. It's his covenant. He chooses how it's going to be carried out. But and don't, don't we wrestle with that a little bit? Here's the problem with that. I think just in our, in our natural humanity, in our natural minds, we, we kind of go to this place sometimes. We just go, man, yeah, maybe God's unfair. Maybe we just want God to be fair all the time. Here's the issue with that. Go back and read Romans 1, 2, and 3. If God was only fair to you all the time, only just, which means you get what you deserve, what will you get? Judgment. That's it. There's no other option for you. You really want God to only be uh, fair to you. You only want God to only be just for you. Guess what? That's what you're going to get. You're going to get what you deserve. The reality is grace is the most beautiful thing in the world because it's not fair to us. It's, it's really not, it's, it's God just going, I have mercy on you. You want justice? You can get justice. But if you want mercy, it's here. And it's in the person of Jesus Christ. I've offered to you grace because every human being in this world, y'all, every person will get only one of two things from God. You only get one of two. This is the only options. You get justice or you get mercy. Nobody gets injustice. Nobody gets injustice. And we talked about last week how God has shown his justice and his mercy where? On the cross of Jesus. It was fulfilled that Jesus received the justice for your sins. And you and I, by faith in him, we receive the, what? The mercy. We receive the grace. So is God unjust? No. He's never been unjust. No one deserves anything, not one iota from him. And so if he chooses to, to let Jacob be the child of promise, and he chooses that the promise of, of him, the covenants of him will be ratified through our faith in Jesus Christ, that is his choice and his hands are open. And as we continue to read through, through chapter nine, I know, listen, as, as you read these chapters, sometimes it can get to this kind of uh, difficult sort of, sort of mind space where, we're just, where we can't get past that idea of, man, is God making a choice here that has nothing to do with me, right? Where, where's the justice? Where's my free will? Where's Jacob's free will? Where's Esau's free will? Seems like God's just making choices and nobody had free will. But again, I would just implore you, go back and read this is not just, chapter nine is not just a place you should open up and start reading by itself, okay? Go back and read Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, because he's making it clear. If you get what your free will earns, you get death and hell. It's all you get. So if you want that to be the way it is, that's what you will receive from the Lord. Or you get mercy. You get the mercy of God. And so he says in verse 20, um, who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Man, he's just, here's, here's the question I think people ask a lot. Why then doesn't God just choose to save everybody? Why, didn't God, why isn't everybody just saved? Right, do you ever ask that question? You ever wonder that? You read this passage and you're thinking, of course, that's a question I should ask. Like, why isn't everybody saved then? But again, that question assumes that salvation would be deserved by any of us. The better question is, why in the world does God choose to save anyone? That's a good question. You and I, friends, we don't deserve anything from him but justice. Jacob didn't deserve to be chosen by God to carry on his promises. Neither did Esau. And so the fact that God makes the choice that he makes, he's free to do so because he's God. That's the point. And that's the point of really all of these chapters. Um, again, I know as I'm walking through some of this, some of you are like, oh, it's, uh, I'm struggling with that. Um, please go listen to the podcast. And there's a lot of other resources out there um, that kind of help you understand a lot of these things. But then we get to chapter 10, right? Um, and so, so Paul is just kind of making it clear as he possibly can that the people of God, 
the true Israel, if you will, have always been people of faith. Faith is a key issue throughout these chapters and the mercy of God is a key issue throughout these chapters. That we have faith and God has mercy. He has shown his mercy to us and we receive that mercy, how? By faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 10, I think is right in the middle of nine and 11 just by the grace of God because he makes it so clear. Here, here's what he says, chapters 10, starting in verse eight. Read along with me. He says, but what does it say? The word, the gospel, that's the word, right? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because they're wondering, right? How do, I know, how do I know God's chosen me unto salvation? How do I know that I've received the promises of God? The answer is simple. Believe in Jesus, that's it. You want to know if you're the people of God? You want to know if you've received his promises? You want to know if Romans 8 applies to you? Believe in Jesus. Put your faith in him. Verse 10, he says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scriptures say, anyone, anyone, everybody say that, anyone, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Guys, it's not as if anybody would call on the name of Jesus, put their hope and their trust in Jesus, and God would just go, nope, sorry, don't, don't, don't want you. You're not part of it. He, he's made it clear. God has given the way for anybody to be saved, for anyone to receive the promises that he has made to his people. It's through faith in his son, Jesus. He has put him forward, uh, we read last week, as a propitiation for our sins, to, to, to bear the wrath of God and the punishment of sin on our behalf, that if we come to him in faith, we're saved. We, we know that we're the people of God. We know that we are in Christ and we have received every promise of the Lord. Um, Paul quotes, by the way, lots of Old Testament scriptures through here. Just to make it clear, this was always the plan, y'all. This was always the plan. God, God never kind of hid this from his people. They didn't see it clearly. But through all the prophets throughout the Old Testament, God was continually making it clear. I am calling not just ethnic Jews, but Gentiles too, the nations to myself. Isaiah is all about this. Go read the prophet Isaiah. All about how God has made it clear that the Israelites, because they've rejected him, now the Gentiles are going to come in and they're going to start to be the people of God. They're going to be called by God to draw near to him. I'm going to call a people who was not my people. I'm going to call a nation who was not my nation, and they're going to come to me. Read Isaiah 55. He talks all about that. And then he says in verse 21, look at 10, 21. This is Israel. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. All day long. God, God's just trying to make it as clear as he can. Paul's making it as clear as he can. No one has an excuse for not being the children of promise because God's promise is you come to faith in Jesus and I've held out my hands to you. Again, Paul runs to the Jewish people again and again and again throughout the book of Acts and they just refuse to listen to him. Jesus told parables about this, right? You know, you know the parable of the, the vineyard owner and he leaves, vineyard owner leaves and he leaves his, his uh, vineyard in charge with some of his servants. And then he's like sends a, a delegate back to go check on the vineyard. And this is like one of the prophets in the Old Testament. He goes back and the servants beat him up and throw him out, right? It's like God was sending his prophets in the Old Testament. The Jews just kept beating him up and sending him out. And then he sent another one and they beat him up and they sent him out. He sent another one that beat him up and they sent him out. Finally, the, the vineyard owner sends his son and what did they do to him? They killed him, rejected him outright. And gosh, just like, I've held out my hand. You know, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Go read Luke 19. He weeps over his people. These are my people. I love them. And they reject me. Paul weeps over them at the beginning of nine. And so chapter 11, he comes back to ethnic Israel. What about them? Still, has God rejected these people? Has God rejected ethnic Israel, the, the, the state of Israel, the nation of Israel? Has God rejected them? Look at verses five and six. 
He says, so too at the present time, there is a, listen, a remnant. This is a hopeful word, okay, for the Jewish people. There's a remnant chosen by grace. Everybody say grace, because grace is a key issue. I told you this. God's promise is a key issue. Faith in Jesus is a key issue throughout here. And grace, it's, he keeps coming back to God's grace, God's mercy. And he's just saying, look, okay, the ethnic Jews, I did make promises to them. And yes, they have rejected me. And yet, by his amazing, like, why would he do this? Other than grace, he just says God's grace has allowed there to be a remnant. There are still some ethnic Jews. I don't know how many, but there's some. And God has given a remnant. And he says, if by grace, then it is no longer by works, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. He's just letting Israel know, um, guys, this story is bigger than just ethnic Israel. And it's bigger than the Gentiles. This is about the whole world. And by the way, as Paul is writing Romans 9, 10, 11, he's doing so. And you can see this as you just, I, I would encourage you, please go read these chapters in their entirety, okay? Because I know I'm just reading some of the verses, but he's, he's making it clear. Like, I, I want you people to be humble, Paul wants the Jews to be humbled, and he's certainly humbled them throughout the letter. But now he wants the Gentiles to be humbled too, because he wants the Gentiles to understand, don't get up on your high horse now, because you're the people of God, because you've received the promises that the Jews should be receiving. If you're sitting on your high horse, guess what? It's still God's prerogative, right? And if you choose now to reject Christ, it's not as if you're going to stay up there. You're not going to stay the people of God. You reject Jesus, you're going to fall too, just like they have, right? Paul just kind of continues to make this point uh, throughout, especially chapter 11 here. Um, and so here, here's, I just want to show us a slide here. So I'm going to read verses 30 through 32, and then we're going to look at this slide that kind of has the uh, kind of five points of what Paul is saying in all of this, okay? Look at verses 30 through 32, chapter 11. He says, just as you who were at one time disobedient to God, he's talking to the Gentiles, you were at one time disobedient to God and you have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, talking about the Jews. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. So whoever, again, the point being God's mercy, right? God has bound all men over to disobedience. That's Romans 1, 2, and 3. There is no one righteous, not even one, no one who does good, no one who seeks God. All together have become worthless. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's every one of us. We are bound in our disobedience. We are bound in sin, Romans chapter 6. But now in Christ Jesus, we've been set free from that. How? By the mercy of God. God's mercy shines all the brighter when we understand that we don't deserve it from him. And so he's just telling Jews and Gentiles, you know how you're saved? The mercy of God. That's the answer. That's how you're saved. So Jew, you know, Jews, don't be too proud because the Gentiles have now come in and been saved by the mercy of God. Gentiles, don't be too proud because the Jews too are saved by the mercies of God. And so if we'll put that slide up there with sort of the five points. Here, here's sort of the overview, okay? I want us to see from these three chapters of God's sovereign plan for Israel in redemptive history. This is a big question I know we have, but, but here's what it is. God chose Israel. That was clear. Old Testament, God made a choice. He chose Israel, Genesis 12, Romans 9, 4, and 5. Number two, Israel rejected God. They rejected God. Go read Isaiah 1, 4. He says it outright. You have rejected God. You've turned away from him, made null and void the promises that he gave to you. But number three, God rejected unbelieving Jews and is now bringing in the Gentiles through faith in Christ. Y'all, by the way, we in this room should be praising the Lord for this plan because we are Gentiles and we get to come in to faith in Jesus, be grafted in. He says in chapter 11, we get to be grafted into the tree of salvation because it's not just about ethnic Jews. It's about all people who come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. He told, the, he told everybody in Romans uh, 4, 16, he said, we are all Abraham's descendants through faith. All of us. Like that's a scandalous thing to say to Jewish people. You're not Abraham's descendants. I am. And Paul says, well, we all are through faith in Jesus Christ. But number four, this, this is where it gets good for the Jews. The Jews will become jealous of the Gentiles, 11, 11, and also turn to faith in Christ. So Here's, here's what he says, because um, I want us to see this little part here. And number, number five, he says, all Israel will be saved. Uh, verse eleven twenty six he says this. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. 
there's a lot of debate about what that means exactly, um, how all Israel will be saved. Some would believe that uh, that means even the Israelites who have already died, even if they rejected Jesus when they died, that at some point before Jesus returns or when he returns, um, they'll have an opportunity to accept Christ. I don't really buy that one. I don't think that's what he's getting at here. Some would believe that um, all the Israelites who are alive when Jesus returns will be saved, every one of them. Right? And some people just simply think it means um, a, a great number, at least, a great number nationally of Israelites, of Jews, will turn to faith in Jesus as Messiah um, before the end. I, I think I fall on that third view because I think, based on the context of everything he says in 9, 10, and 11, it's about all of Israel being um, what, what it says here believing Jews now and Gentiles now, that's us, and those who will be saved, right? All who will come to faith in Jesus. And I'm very hopeful. I really am very hopeful um, that before the end of all things, man, God will do a great work in the nation of Israel to turn their hearts back to Jesus as Messiah. Um, guys, I think we should pray for this all the time. I think we should especially pray for this around Easter time. Um, a lot of Christians do around Easter um, because the Jews around Easter, like their Passover, they're praying for the Messiah to come. Do y'all know that? That's what the Jews are doing while we're celebrating that he has come. They're praying for him to come. How sad is that? So for us as Christians, these are our, our, our sort of our brothers and sisters through Abraham, right? And so we're praying for them. God, would you just let them see and fulfill this promise to them that they would come back to faith in Jesus. And so hopefully that, that helps a little bit as we, as we read through these chapters. Um, and I want to end it the way Paul ends it with a doxology, um, because there's a reason I think he ends it with this. Chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, Paul ends it with a doxology. A doxology is really just a, a worshipful moment. It's a, it's a song of praise, a, a word of praise. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Why does Paul end this section, this kind of different and often difficult section of scripture? Why does he end it with a doxology? Here's why. Because this is the point. This has always been the point. Worship. The worship of God. The awe and the fear and the reverence and the love and the glory of God is always the point. Guys, that's why he started this earth in the first place, was for his glory. That's why he called Abraham, was for his glory. That's why he chose the nation of Israel to be his people, to carry his promises forward, to bring about the Messiah so that he could bring about the redemption of the world through his death and his resurrection. You know why? For his glory. And Paul is just lifting up the glory of God to say simply this to Jews and Gentiles. How, Jews, how are you saved? through the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge and his grace. Gentiles, how are you saved? Through the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge by his grace. You, today, how are you saved? Through the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge, through his grace. How am I saved? Through the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge, through his grace. It's always about God and his grace. You and I, the Jews and the Gentiles, we're not his counselors, y'all. No one, he said that, like no one's ever been the counselor to God. No one's ever given to God that he should be repaid by God. We are at his mercy. So these chapters are written not for you and I to just debate. These chapters are written so that we would adore God. So that we would look to him as our all sufficient father and humbly fall down before him in faith and in worship to him. And so the application today is this. Let's bow down before Jesus. Let's bow before the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Let's bow before the mercy of God and salvation. Let's bow before his perfect plans and purposes that no, we don't always understand. Let's bow before God himself, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And you know what? Let's pray for the Jews to turn to Jesus. 
Let's do that today. Let's do that every day. We're going to sing one more song. I invite you to just stand and sing with us. If you want to just let this be a time of, of prayer, please do that as well. Let me pray for us. And then let's worship him. God, thank you that you have a perfect plan. And you have a perfect promise that you have completed in Christ Jesus. And now everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. We trust that. That we know for sure. So God, we lift up the name of Christ today. Let us humble ourselves under you and just confess that your riches of wisdom and knowledge are so much greater than ours. And we trust you with all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.